Good evening and welcome to our 10th episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa for 2021. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, and I'm streaming to you live from Johannesburg, South Africa. Tonight, Dr. Simeon Bazeng Bazeng will be sharing some of his important work across Africa, driving biodiversity monitoring and upskilling selected countries to improve their conservation practices. But before we get into tonight's main course, here are a few announcements and some housekeeping rules. You can communicate with us this evening using the Zoom chat room. And remember to select all panelists and attendees if you want everyone listening to be able to see your message. Please ask your questions to our speaker using the Q&A box throughout the webinar on Zoom. And if you're tuned in through Facebook Live this evening, you can use the comment feed for your comments and questions. Our speaker will answer these at the end of his webinar. Now we do love hearing from all of you, so let us know that you're tuning in on all major social media channels using the hashtag Conservation Conversations. If you've missed out on any of our previous episodes, you can catch up with the recordings on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel or listen to them via our podcast available on all major streaming, streaming services. We'd like to encourage all of you listening tonight to please head on over to our YouTube channel and click the subscribe <coughs> button to help us grow our support for the webinar content. Now, a big thank you to those of you who continue to generously donate towards the production of these webinars using the Quicket Donations platform. All you have to do is scan the QR code using your phone camera or visit the Conservation Conversations webpage to find the link to our donations portal. I'll also be posting the link to the donations portal in tonight's chat box, so you can find the link there if you are interested in supporting these webinars. Your contributions help us to keep these talks free for all to learn and enjoy. Now, Outliers Coffee are roasting for a cause in support of BirdLife South Africa's landscape conservation program and the work that we do to conserve our most threatened birds and habitats in South Africa. Get your very own Dawn Chorus coffee as grounds or whole beans in 250 grams or one kilogram packets online today. You can see the link below or in the chat feed in a moment to place your order. Enjoy the fresh, delicious kickstart to your day that every early birder needs. Proceeds from these sales will go to our conservation work and we encourage all of our viewers watching to buy their Dawn Chorus from Outliers Coffee today. It certainly is the way that I like to start my day. Now, BirdLife South Africa's fifth virtual Learn About Birds or Lab conference will run on 27 and 28 May 2021. And this will be done through the Zoom platform. The deadline for early bird registrations, which are cheaper than the standard registrations, will close on 31 March 2021. So that deadline is approaching rapidly. Please do sign up so that you don't miss out on this good offer. Registrations can be carried out through the BirdLife South Africa website and I'll be placing a link for that in the chat box in a moment as well. You can register to attend both Science and Layman's Lab for just 700 Rand, or you can attend only the Layman's Lab lectures in the evenings for just 300 Rand. To find out more and to register and pay for this event, please visit the BirdLife South Africa website or email lab2021 at birdlife.org.za. And this will be the preceding event to our annual 2021 AGM, which is going virtual this year and will be held on the 29th of May. To register for this important event, please visit the Flock page under the Events tab on our website or email flock2021 at birdlife.org.za to find out more. Now, BirdLife South Africa is excited to bring back the Cycle in the Bush, our annual mountain bike fundraising event. And this is run together with Escape Cycle Tours and Abelina Game Reserve. We're pleased to invite you to join internationally renowned commentator Phil Liggett on a three-day adventure in the gorgeous Abilana Game Reserve in the Greater Kruger region. This is your chance to be part of an exciting and memorable event with the voice of cycling Phil Liggett. We've managed to secure a really great deal this year, so come join us for some great cycling and soul restoring time in the wilderness from Friday 24 September to Monday 27 September. Please contact Lindsay Smith at birdlife.org.za for more information and to book your spot. Now, another exciting event that is coming up is that of the Flock to Marion trip. And bookings are once again open for this once-in-a-lifetime trip to cruise down to the Marion Island waters. 
and this will be taking place in January 2022. You can join 2,000 other birders on board the cruise ship on an expedition into South Africa's Southern Ocean Islands. There are over 70 possible seabird species to see. So those of you looking to build your life list, be sure to book your spot on this once in a lifetime trip. There's also nearly 20 seals and cetaceans to view as well. A team of over 40 expert guides <laughs> will be on board. And very importantly, your bookings are contributing to BirdLife South Africa's work, in particular, our Saving Marion Island Seabirds project. Now, last week, Andrew, Callan, Vincent, and Etienne gave a really thought-provoking webinar on the ethics of birding and debated whether ticking on calls versus seeing a bird should become an acceptable practice. The South African Listers Club, a proudly South African community of birders that have ticked 300 birds or more in our diverse country's boundaries, is now allowing herd life of birds onto this list. Joining is as simple as typing your name, hometown, and total into the form on the South African Listers Club webpage, which is on your screen now. We'll also post a link to this in the chat feed at the end of this intro. If you are already a member, remember to update your totals regularly. And now it is finally time to introduce our incredible speaker this evening. A big welcome to my colleague and friend, Dr. Simeon Bezeng Bezeng. Dr. Simeon Bezeng holds a PhD in the field of botany from the University of Johannesburg. And in 2018, through a joint position with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Species Survival Commission, that is quite a mouthful, Bezeng, also known mm -hmm. as the IUCN Species Survival Commission, as well as BirdLife South Africa, Zeng was able to start his current role as the Regional Red List Manager and Key Biodiversity Areas Program Manager at BirdLife South Africa. And this is housed within the Regional Conservation Program. In this position, Zeng works across the African continent to build capacity and mobilize foundational biodiversity information that can be used to monitor trends, inform conservation action, and identify pressures on biodiversity. Zeng spends much of his time training and upskilling conservationists, environmental oh. monitors, and politicians on how to apply the IUCN Red List categories for species and ecosystems, as well as the new KBA standards. And these are key biodiversity areas. Zeng also serves on both of the IUCN Species Survival Commission Red List Steering Committees, and I am really looking forward to hearing about his adventures through Africa, upskilling our future conservationists. Zeng, thank you so much for joining us on Conservation Conversations. You are welcome to now share your screen with the audience, and we are really looking forward to what you have to share with us this evening. Thank you. Can you see my screen, Melissa? I can. Take it away. Okay. All right. Um, how do I get this off? I don't know if you can see the little icon. I'm just trying to, to get it off. Um, no problem, Bazang. We can see it perfectly fine. OK. Thank you very much, Melissa, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to everyone that is joining on the various uh, uh, BirdLife South Africa social media platform, uh, Facebook, YouTube. And it's indeed a great pleasure to be with you this evening. I'll be manning the stage to to talk to you about the kind of support BirdLife South Africa is giving to, to other African countries to identify the most important places for biodiversity. And this is not going to be uh, like this, your conventional uh, conservation convention webinar series. It's more going to, to look at the kind of exciting conservation work that BirdLife South Africa has led over the years in South Africa. And the lessons we've learned from the lessons and experiences we've learned from those uh, uh, petting edge uh, conservation work, and how we're supporting other African countries to to identify these important places to safeguard biodiversity. But before I go into my presentation, I'd just like to to state an important caveat. I'm a botanist, like uh, Melissa uh, rightly introduced me, and before joining BirdLife South Africa. I couldn't identify any bird uh, smaller than a southern ground hornbill. And when, when, when Melissa actually asked for my favorite bird, I quickly thought about that. But now I'm, I'm really fascinated by uh, seeing uh, with the, the several bird, birding expeditions that I've had with a few colleagues and my affiliation to the Ron Babbitt uh, Bird Club. I go on several bird watching uh, expeditions and I'm really fascinated now 
looking at even to the smallest birds like your bronze mannequin and really enjoying the kind of interactions uh, these birds have with uh, other biodiversity, including plants and, uh, and, and mammals. So uh, I'll move into my presentation. Oh, gosh. Okay, so uh, before getting into the, the real details of the presentation, it is really important for us to understand why BirdLife South Africa is not only working in South Africa, but now using that experience to, to be able to support other African countries. Like you know, uh, BirdLife South Africa is regarded by the BirdLife International Partnership as one of the strongest partners, not only in Africa, but uh, globally in terms of the, the really exciting, uh, uh, successful conservation work uh, that has been done. And the focus has really been on conservation, but also bird life is really strong in terms of uh, the financial administration and also in terms of uh, the governance. When we look at uh, uh, the, bird, the bird life structure as a whole, Bird Life South Africa structure as a whole, uh, the conservation division under, underwent a restructuring in 2019, and there was a real emphasis to, 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 to prioritize work that is being done at the regional level. So we have a program now that's called the Regional Conservation Program that really looks at, at working across uh, many African countries to support them in terms of IUCN red list, and uh, I'll talk more about this, which is red list of species, uh, key biodiversity area identification, uh, East Atlantic Flyway Initiative, uh, identifying other effective area-based conservation measures. So um, another very great motivation is that BirdLife South Africa is amongst the first countries in the world to, to produce a red data book, which uh, highlights uh, Melissa. I don't know if you can see this uh, screen on top of my stuff or I can, is, is it fine? Melissa? Sorry, Zeng, we can see your talk absolutely fine. You can carry on. Okay, all right, cool. So BirdLife South Africa is amongst uh, uh, one of the countries, the, the top countries in the world, the first countries in the world to produce a red data book, which uh, really looks at the conservation status of all birds in South Africa, including neighboring countries like Lesotho and Swaziland, and in this data book, we can really see the conservation status, the threat status of all the birds that are, are found within this area or this region. And a good example is the bird of the year, which is uh, uh, the Cape Rock jumper, which is a near threatened species. So it doesn't qualify for any of the uh, 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 threat categories, but it just nearly meets that, that threat, threat category for, for uh, species uh, extinction. <clears throat> and uh, but BirdLife South Africa is now using this information in the Red Data Book to contribute to what's called the State of the World Bird that looks at uh, the state of all, uh, almost all the 11,000 bird species that are in the world. And we can now see very important trends that are coming out from this kind of report. Like we have 2% uh, of, of all birds that are critically endangered, that they're facing extremely high risks of extinction, we can see about 77% uh, of species that are least concerned. So these are species that are widespread and facing very minimal risk uh, uh, pressures. And then we can see that we have less than 1% uh, of these species that are data deficient. It means we don't know much about their ecology. We don't know much about their population status. And hence, we cannot really apply the IUCN red list categories on them. And very important trends are coming out from such analysis on the contribution of bird life uh, South Africa to this global process. As you can see it's like one, one in eight in all in eight bird species are globally threatened with extinction. And just looking at that global scenario, at a national level also, bird life South Africa is using uh, uh, this kind of state of bird report to produce a South African state of bird report uh, where we begin to see that over 130 bird species are regionally threatened with extinction just in South Africa. These are really massive uh, uh, numbers of species that are threatened with extinction. So uh, we, know, we know the threat status facing our, our birds or all the pressures that uh, our birds are facing. And really important ones that I would like to highlight here is poisoning, which is a massive problem, especially in the Southern African region 
where we've seen uh, conflicts with, uh, with, with, with human and poison of uh, large population of vulture species. Uh, habitat destruction is a key. We see here more of the uh, habitat for these species are being uh, uh, removed, not having a good habitat for the birds to nest and, 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 and reproduce. Uh, another very key work that BirdLife South Africa is also leading is uh, uh, on invasive species. And there's this very great project that BirdLife South Africa is leading on to uh, eradicate uh, mice on uh, Marion Island. Uh, mice have a very big or invasive species have a very big impact on our bird species. And then illegal trade either in the whole bird uh, species or in their body parts. This is a massive problem, especially in uh, African and Asian countries. We see illegal trade uh, that is going unabated. Uh, large scale mechanized farming. This is a big problem for all our ground dwelling bird species really big problem uh, uh, that is causing huge pressure on them. Then the development of large infrastructures like your, your power lines, uh, these have big impact on, on birds through collision and execution. And then bycatch is really a massive problem for, for our seabird species. This is a, a big problem and BirdLife South Africa is really uh, uh, trying to understand how to, to, to address these uh, challenges not looking at the impact of climate change, which is also very big on, on birds. So these are amongst uh, the threats that uh, most of our birds are facing. So we, we understand, sorry, we, we understand these threats that our birds are facing and BirdLife South Africa is working with several uh, uh, NGOs um, and stakeholders in, in, in the landscape to identify strategies that can be used to minimize or mitigate their impact. And I will not talk much about this because uh, my, my fellow colleagues have really uh, given some webinars on this, but just to highlight the work on uh, the Abatros Task Force, where they are working with local people to develop these birds carrying lines that are attached to vessels. And uh, we know uh, bird, uh, our seabirds uh, have, uh, like the fishing gears really have a massive impact to uh, collision with, uh, with, with our birds. So, Developing these bird scaring lines has really helped to reduce uh, this impact and reduce death in our seabird species. Then uh, working with, uh, with various stakeholders to develop guidelines to reduce uh, lead exposure. As we know, lead is a lead in uh, ammunition through hunting is, is a big problem to, to our bird species and looking at alternatives for lead free ammunition. And one very, very great initiative is this vulture safe zones where colleagues from BirdLife South Africa are working with uh, various stakeholders, including landowners, to identify areas that can save as uh, safe havens for our bird, uh, uh, our vulture populations. Then working with, uh, private, with the private sector, like uh, ESCOM, the work that BirdLife South Africa is leading with ESCOM, to identify and protect uh, habitat for critically uh, uh, endangered uh, bird species. This is really important work that uh, BirdLife South Africa is also leading. Um, and then for species that are less known or species that are threatened with extinction, we have tried to understand the, uh, the biodiversity knowledge gaps and we, have, we are now developing various conservation actions to ensure species survival. And for such species, I really want to highlight the work of uh, the white wing fluff tail, uh, like Melissa did. Um, uh, Introduce. This is this is one of the world's rarest birds and also uh, a critically endangered bird. Working with various stakeholders, uh, BirdLife South Africa colleagues from BirdLife South Africa are working to improve the habitat and the conservation status of this species. And some really exciting uh, 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 news that are coming out from such work is we have now the first uh, confirmed call for this species that has been recorded, and we have. Uh, uh, the first breeding, uh, 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 the first breeding record in South Africa that has also been uh, uh, observed. Then, at the habitat or site level, we know any conservation action that we're doing for species without protecting the habitat where the species uh, are found might be detrimental to the species. So, at at the habitat level, BirdLife South Africa is really leading in, in this space in terms of identifying 
the core uh, knowledge products of bird life, the partnership, which is important bird and biodiversity areas. And in 2015, we now revise this, uh, 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 the network of important IBS in South Africa. And also bird life South Africa is supporting, uh, is working with other uh, stakeholders at the national level to pioneer the identification of key biodiversity areas. And I'll talk more about this in the slides ahead, which are sites that contribute significantly to the persistence of global biodiversity. So not only using bird data, but using other uh, uh, data from other taxonomic groups to identify sites that are of global importance to biodiversity. So all this exceptional work that I've, I've, I've uh, uh, mentioned here, BirdLife South Africa has been able to support South Africa to report on many biodiversity commitments at national and international level, including your reports on the national biodiversity strategies and action plans, your convention on biological diversity, the convention on migratory species, convention on international trade in endangered uh, flora and fauna, and then on your sustainable development goal. So this is really exceptional work that BirdLife South Africa is leading. But when we go broader into the African continent, we don't see this kind of work or where, where it is, it is really insufficient. Meanwhile, Africa is home to biodiversity. Like you see, uh, Africa is home to, we have eight of the 36 biodiversity hotspots. So a hotspot is an area of high biodiversity uh, richness and endemism, uh, species that are found only within a particular region and nowhere else. So imagine losing these species, uh, what consequences it could have for, for, for biodiversity and livelihood. And two of African countries are amongst the top 10 uh, mega, uh, mega diverse countries in the world, that's South Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So from this uh, uh, biodiversity hotspot, we have uh, the succulent Karoo. So those are like regions of exceptional biodiversity, high in, in richness and endemism. We have the Maputa land and Pondo land, Albany. We have the Horn of Africa. We have the uh, Madagascar. Uh, 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 the Madagascar and the Indian Ocean Islands. We have the uh, uh, Cape Floristic region. We have the Horn of Africa, the Eastern Afro Mountain. These are all uh, major biodiversity hotspots within uh, the African continent. And like I said, I'm not I'm not really a good bird specialist. Uh, so <laughs> you just see some of these important birds that really attract thousands of visitors and tourists to come and watch birds in these biodiversity hotspots. Like in South Africa, you have your sugar, uh, uh, cape, uh, uh, sugar bird, you have the banded uh, barbet, you have your Madagascar red 40, you have your Karu Kohan, and yeah, your banded uh, wattle and the Pembe white eye. So those are some very important birds that attract thousands of visitors every year to watch birds across this uh, uh, biodiversity hotspot. So despite this, this rich biodiversity that I've just uh, uh, mentioned, many African countries have lagged behind in providing biodiversity data, in assessing the biodiversity, in mobilizing that data in comparison to many European and, and American countries. And several reasons could be uh, uh, advanced for those. In most African countries, we have uh, insufficient biodiversity experts the level of biodiversity and taxonomic experts in the continent has been on a steady decline since uh, the late uh, 1980s. And this is very evident even for, 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 for example, countries uh, that are showing, or continents that are showing progress towards identifying important sites for, for birds. You see our America and, and Europe at the top there and Africa at the very bottom. And uh, one other reason is uh, political instability. So political instability is the order of the day in most African countries. When you look at the political instability index uh, that was uh, uh, published in 2009, which might be even worse now, you see a whole lot of African countries uh, that are amongst the top 10, uh, the most political, uh, politically instab instable countries. And when such events happen, you find people leaving the cities and running into, into the forests or uh, where biodiversity is sitting, really preventing people from uh, mobilizing and assessing this biodiversity data. Then we have insufficient resources, both financial and technical. 
in most African countries, uh, the, the local governments do not really prioritize uh, biodiversity conservation. And the funds that are always allocated for biodiversity conservation are always uh, small compared to other sectors. Meanwhile, biodiversity really underpins uh, economic development through ecotourism and so on. And then if we look just within the IUCN, we can see that many, many countries Many countries have been trained on how to apply the IUCN standards to assess biodiversity or to, uh, uh, to, to evaluate the conservation status of biodiversity. And many African countries are still way behind and just few trainings have, have happened in African countries. And so our approach really is to support and build capacity in many, as many African countries as possible to mobilize foundational biodiversity information that can be used to uh, evaluate the status of biodiversity so we know where our threatened and uh, range restricted species are to understand the trends in biodiversity. So we monitor, we do repeat assessments of species to be able to understand if uh, species are recovering or declining over time and then understand those pressures on national biodiversity. And we use uh, tools that have been mobilized or uh, knowledge products from the IUCN or mobilized by the IUCN for example, the red list of species where uh, we want to know on the landscape which species are threatened with extinction. And we want to know, for example, which species are widespread that are least concerned, are less threatened, which species have been extinct, which spe species are facing uh, extremely high risks of extinction. And then we want to also use the red list data to be able to uh, evaluate uh, uh, or assess the conservation uh, status of ecosystems. As we know, ecosystems do not go extinct. They only collapse. That is, they lost their key characteristics features. And then uh, using your red list and your uh, red list of species and your red list of ecosystem information to be able to identify what you call key biodiversity area, which are sites that contribute significantly to the global persistence of biodiversity. And I'll explain more about this uh, standard as we go on, showing some examples of the kind of work we are doing across the continent to support African countries. So for, for example, um, when we say a species is least concerned, it's, that is a taxon that has been uh, evaluated against the IUCN criteria, like I showed you from extinct to uh, not evaluated, and it does not qualify for any of the threatened uh, category that is critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable but the species is widespread. And a good example is your great white egret or your acacia tortillis. And uh, working with uh, various stakeholders across Africa, we have been able to support countries like Cameroon, uh, Kenya, Mozambique to bring together a, a, a cohort of uh, uh, biodiversity experts that can identify what priorities or which species to include. In, in, in this biodiversity assessment, we've been able to work with them, very knowledgeable uh, species experts in, in, in various countries to understand the state of uh, biodiversity data and how the data has been mobilized. And then moving from there to organize uh, capacity building uh, workshops where we train not just the senior experts, but also those uh, uh, biologists at the national level from universities to to uh, NGOs to apply the IUCN uh, red list uh, of species standard to uh, evaluate the conservation status of species. So we want to know which species are, are threatened. And not just focusing on, on birds, but also looking at other uh, taxonomic groups like plants, freshwater fish, uh, small mammals, uh, uh, reptiles and amphibians and so on. And then, uh, like I said, we, we then also apply the the standard on, on ecosystems, where we look at the ecosystem conditions, and then we apply the, uh, the red list category to be able to, uh, to look to identify those ecosystems that are at risk to collapse. Like I said, ecosystems don't go extinct. They only lost their key characteristic features. And this is a work, uh, uh, work that we do in partnership with the South African, uh, that BirdLife leads in, part, in partnership with the South African National Biodiversity Institute 
and the United Nations Environmental Program World Conservation Monitoring Center. That's a very long, that's a very long acronym. So the short one, uh, that's a very long name. The short, uh, the acronym is uh, UNEP WCMC. So we're working with various uh, spatial ecologists in Ethiopia to be able to um, spatially map the different ecosystem types in, in, in Ethiopia, look at their ecological conditions, look at their protection level, and then be able to mainstream the kind of products that we, we are generating into policy to support uh, local economic development. And we identify various entry points at, uh, at, the, at the national level that we can use to mainstream these uh, special products we are developing. And so uh, in, uh, in 2004, at the World Conservation Congress in, in Bangkok, Thailand, the IUCN membership established a task force that aimed at, at looking at uh, developing a methodology to identify key biodiversity areas. Like you know, for the birds, they have the important birds and biodiversity areas. The plants have the tropical important plant area. The butterflies have the prime butterfly areas. And then we have area uh, like Alliance for Zero Extinction sites, which are sites that hold single population of, 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 of threatened species. But the membership thought, that it would not be nice to have uh, all these products in, working in silo because the birds need the plants, they need the other animals to be able to interact, they feed on the insect. So can we have a product that is consolidated? Let's have a, uh, what's called a key biodiversity area. So this task force uh, met and for many years through several consultations, in 2016 published the, the new standards that is called key biodiversity areas which are sites that contribute significantly to the persistence of global biodiversity. So it's not just for animals, it's not just for birds, it's for birds and other biodiversity. And what we have been doing, uh, uh, South Africa has applied that standard and BirdLife South Africa, like I mentioned before, has really supported that process where we have established uh, what is called a key biodiversity area, national coordination group. And I'll talk more about this in the slides ahead. And this key, uh, key biodiversity area national coordination group is leading the identification and the uh, delineation of those sites at the country level that uh, are important for biodiversity globally. And we've been able to use that experience in South Africa to support many African countries, uh, including Mozambique, uh, uh, um, Kenya, Malawi, Cameroon, and many and so many other countries as interest arises to identify or to establish this national coordination groups and hence identify key biodiversity areas. And I would like to highlight the work that we've supported in Mozambique uh, uh, through our support. Mozambique has been able to identify um, 30 key biodiversity areas across the, the landscape and many more potential KBAs that need confirmation because we need to confirm uh, species present at site. So we didn't have any confirmation of, of those species at the time of, uh, of the identification process. And so, uh, uh, for example, if we zoom in, we can just see one site, which is the Mount uh, uh, Namoli. This uh, as here, you can see the various uh, um, biodiversity elements that are within, uh, within this KBA, within the KBA and then uh, the various uh, uh, species, including birds, some plants and animal species that are on, on the mountain. This, this area also attracts a whole lot of visitors that come for bird washing and other uh, uh, research expeditions. And supporting Africa generally in, in the process, we have been able to uh, support many countries to, 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 uh, to, we have been able to support many African countries to identify this important site and the kind of uh, support we've done. So we've, we've provided so far these countries to identify the site and identify those uh, or establish those uh, key biodiversity areas, uh, national coordination group. Those groups have been established in South Africa, Uganda, Mozambique, and Malawi just for, for freshwater species. Uh, and then where NCGs have been formed only is in Kenya, Tunisia, and Nigeria. But there's a lot of interest uh, in many, many African countries, including 11 or so African countries 
where we are collaborating now with the IUC, ICN Secretariat and the KBA Secretariat to train uh, uh, various uh, uh, spatial ecologists from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Ghana, uh, and Cameroon soon to uh, apply the KBA standards and then establish a key biodiversity area uh, a national coordination group. So that's the kind of support we are providing broadly to these African countries. So what is our motivation to really work at the national level? As we know, most of the conservation standards are set at a global level through the IECN processes, your uh, CBD processes, conventional and biological diversity processes. But we know the real conservation action really happens at the national level. So we have adopted the IECN framework of, 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 of a species conservation cycle, which is called cycle, which is called uh, Assess Plan Act, with another major component of communicate and network. So we want to really communicate uh, the success stories that are coming out from uh, conservation actions. And through this, through this assess plan uh, act, uh, con species conservation cycle, we want to work with biologists at a national level to be able to mobilize the foundational biodiversity data and assess the conservation status of all the species. So we know uh, uh, their conservation status and we know their, their traits. And then working with, uh, with various stakeholders, we need to facilitate the identification of best strategies to conserve uh, biodiversity. So developing single and multi-species uh, conservation plans, and then working again with the stakeholders to be able to um, develop conservation actions on the ground, including local people to improve the conservation status of biodiversity in, in general. So applying this model of this ICN model that we've uh, adopted, we, we, we have shown that uh, conservation works. Uh, we just need to do more of conservation. So using this, using this IUCN model, we have been able to, to show that uh, many species can be brought back from, from brink of extinction. And a great example, I'll just share very few of them, is the great, uh, greater adjutant stock. As we know, this is uh, an Asian species that has been highly, uh, uh, that has suffered like uh, a great uh, uh, impact on its population due to unchecked uh, egg collection and the chicks and also habitat uh, destruction. But working with, with uh, various uh, stakeholders, including local communities, these species have uh, experienced a remarkable increase in their population. And the work of the Cambodian uh, government, including the Wildlife Conservation Society, working with local people, have really helped in, in uh, uh, bringing uh, these species back from extinction. And a great, another great example is the American bison. And for those who follow the IUCN uh, updates, we could see that this really made a big uh, news splash when uh, uh, the red list was updated. And this was a species that was very common in, in the wild in North America in the early 1900s. But conflicts with uh, humans and, 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 uh, uh, and cattle really led to the dissemination of the species with only 1,100 individuals remaining in the wild. But uh, working with uh, various stakeholders again, and including uh, local people, these species could benefit from, uh, from uh, conservation efforts. So these examples and many more really show that we know how to do conservation. We just need to do more. We just need to do more and we need to work with the right uh, stakeholders in, in, in order to ensure uh, species survival. So we now start looking at what mechanisms are available at the national level to be able to make sure that species recover from uh, the brink of extinction. And one very great initiative is the reverse the rate, which is a global uh, initiative that is really pioneered or incited at the, at the national level that brings together different partners. So from your media to your youth, to your government, to the different NGOs that are working on the landscape, to take actions for species and habitat conservation. And the, the mission of, of, of this uh, uh, reverse the red is really to unite tools and partnerships, to catalyze conservation efforts and support countries in delivering your CBD uh, post 2020 target. So what we want to do is really working with the local, local people, like I said, uh, conservation action really happens at the national level. 
So we want to work with the local people to be able to make sure conservation efforts are uh, effective. So the, 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 the reverse the red, as uh, some of you might have noticed through uh, some of the webinars that have been going on, is in four phases. Uh, I think the first phase is really the partnership where we are building the partnership with the various uh, 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 stakeholders, including media, uh, uh, donors to come on board and, and uh, support this initiative. And the, the process is going to be launched at the World Conservation Congress, hopefully in September in Marcel. And then we already have a, a global center for species survivor that has been established and is hosted by the Indiana Police Zoo. And the second phase will really be the national rollout of this, uh, this campaign, where different countries will have uh, national hubs, where you have uh, people dedicated to assessing the conservation status of species, to planning conservation actions, and then developing those underground, uh, on the ground uh, conservation efforts to ensure species uh, recovery. And then we really, uh, the third phase is going to be that social movement where we want to incite conservation and make people uh, uh, aware of, of, of uh, biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity to livelihood. And the last phase, which is really, um, they organize, want to organize the uh, um, Global Congress for Species, where we want to showcase a whole lot of uh, success stories and lessons learned uh, on species conservation actions. And yeah, you can see more, more of this information on the website, the Reverse the Red website, and also follow many uh, webinars that have been scheduled uh, to talk about this process and share examples of uh, uh, really good uh, conservation success stories at the national level. And then one, one very uh, uh, big initiative that is also coming that was uh, uh, also inspired by the fact that most conservation uh, work that has been pioneered in, in most African countries has been done by European and American experts. But it, the, the fact is that it only included very few, very few experts at the national level. And even in cases where those experts were included, the, the, the product in some countries has been rejected by the national government, which was seen more as an academic exercise than a, a country initiative. So we are now establishing this um, um, IUCN uh, uh, Species Survivor National Species Specialist Group. So it's going to be a group at the national level that is coordinating all the activities of species conservation and making sure it is being mainstreamed into policy and supporting uh, local uh, 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 economic development activities. And the, the core remit of this group is going to be assessment. So they will lead national assessments of, 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 of species. Uh, they will provide support that will fit into global assessment processes. They will help in planning. That's, you just follow the IUCN uh, uh, species conservation cycle to assess, plan, and act. And they're also very much in, uh, uh, involved in identifying research uh, priorities and monitoring priorities for, for species that are found in the country. Then on the KBA front, we have the KBA National Coordination Group. And this is the case for South Africa. Like I said, we we really helping other African countries to establish this national coordination group. And the purpose, the whole purpose of this group is to coordinate the process of identifying these important sites for biodiversity, uh, drawing those uh, uh, reasonable boundaries around those points, around those uh, uh, important sites for biodiversity, and making sure that the standards, the global standard, is is uh, is well applied. And then uh, they will have, once those sites are applied, uh, once those sites have been identified, the, the National Coordination Group will help in promoting the conservation and management, conservation management and protection of those sites in country, and also making sure those sites are mainstream into the various uh, national, uh, national and international policy instruments. So what is the, the significance of this work that we are doing in, across many African countries? Uh, most of you will be aware of the China uh, Belt and Road Initiative, where China is, is investing in massive economic development uh, uh, initiatives across Africa. And for most of these this, this, uh, 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 development uh, uh, projects, some of them have been earmarked, some are already underway, some feasibility studies are, are ongoing. And for some projects, like biodiversity data has been requested and where it's not been provided. These projects have gone ahead 
to the detriment of biodiversity. Like I showed you, biodiversity, Africa is very rich in biodiversity, and we can imagine the consequences for, for livelihood. So most of these projects actually pass through several African countries, like you can see, and they're cutting through many potential uh, key biodiversity areas, yet many African countries do not have the right, they have not assessed that biodiversity data information, or they don't even have it in the right format that can be used to inform uh, such development processes. And a good example is this uh, petition that was sent out uh, where Total wants to, to build a massive pipeline across the heart of Africa that will rip through physical places for biodiversity and will displace many people um, along the way with many potential consequences for, for, for greenhouse gas emission. But if we could partially map where this biodiversity exists, where the critical sites are, we can strategically guide where such massive developments can happen. We are not against massive, we are not against development. We really want development to happen at sites that are, 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 are not sensitive to biodiversity. So having or knowing where these sites are will really help in guiding such uh, investment uh, opportunities. And uh, really uh, a big, another big example, which is akin to many countries, not only in, in, in Africa, is this effect of, uh, so what we are seeing here is an overlay of the ecological zones in Cameroon, uh, the mining, uh, the protected areas in red and the various mining concessions in yellow. And what is very clear from this is that you can see uh, uh, mining happening within protected area. Like I said, this is a, a situation that is akin to many uh, countries, including South Africa. And BirdLife South Africa has supported this kind of initiative where a coalition of NGOs can come to, to contest uh, 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 mining development in such uh, important sites for, for biodiversity. But yet in many African countries, we don't have this biodiversity data in the right format to be able to, to inform such uh, processes. And then one, one very big example also is the development of uh, agroforestry across many African countries. And <clears throat> this is a glaring example in Gabon where the, the, the government of Gabon and this agroforestry industry, Olam, signed a joint venture to develop an initial phase of 50 hectares of oil palm in the savanna. We all know how much or how valuable the savannas are for our birds and other biodiversity and for water uh, provision, but such processes are happening in, in, in the savannah, which are really critical sites for, for biodiversity. And to imagine this is just the initial phase, many more of these uh, uh, habitats are going to be cleared to, to plant uh, this uh, oil palm. So supporting African countries, uh, the kind of work we are doing with supporting African countries to report better on, 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 on biodiversity commitment. Like you know, many African countries, including South Africa, are signatories to the Convention on Biodiversity, which is a multilateral environmental agreement to preserve uh, biodiversity. And so providing biodiversity in the right format can really help countries to, to, to report better on biodiversity, and especially looking at uh, your IG targets five, seven and 11, which looks at protected area, where protected area should be expanded, uh, where uh, your threatened species uh, should be. And by enabling the development or repeat assessment of species, we can, we can calculate the red, uh, the red list index of, of a particular group or at the, at the country level, we can calculate that red list index that really shows the trends in biodiversity. Is biodiversity recovering over time or is it declining? And also <clears throat> as an indicator of uh, target 11, uh, identifying key biodiversity areas can really guide where your protected and conserve, uh, conservation areas should be expanded into. And also reporting on a very important uh, multilateral environmental agreement, the Sustainable Development Goal 14 and 15, KBAs are really used as an indicator for that. Then uh, uh, just one of the last examples, uh, when we have biodiversity that is partially mapped, we can be able to inform where large development can happen. And the work uh, here that has been done in South Africa has really helped uh, your large, uh, your private um, uh, sector like the ESCOM to strategically uh, place their power lines along areas that are not sensitive to biodiversity, 
So we have map uh, for species where where uh, they are sensitive for biodiversity and those ecosystems that are very sensitive. And then we can now strategically help uh, 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 the private sector to, to mitigate their risks uh, on biodiversity. So uh, <clears throat> just to conclude, identifying the most important places for biodiversity can really guide uh, conservation priority setting. So we can know where to focus our conservation efforts. As we know, uh, we have been very, like I said in the, at the beginning of my presentation, we don't have the, the resources to, to do that. And so identifying those important sites for biodiversity can really help um, in conservation priority setting. We don't also have a lot of funding to guide conservation work. So identifying those critical sites for biodiversity can help government and donors to really focus in particular areas that will yield effective and efficient conservation benefits. And like I said, uh, across Africa and many, many, uh, many countries, protected areas have always been declared based on the distribution of your large mammals and uh, has always ignored like your, your plants and your, your, your reptiles and amphibians. So identifying those important sites for biodiversity and strategically guide where protected area, where your protected area network should be expanded into. And then governments can use uh, these important sites for biodiversity to engage with the private sector to minimize their risks on biodiversity. And then <clears throat> countries can use this important site uh, uh, to, to report on the global commitment and responsibilities for identifying important sites of biodiversity, which are also important sites for like stopover for species and, and yeah, and other biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you so much for saying that was a fantastic overview of the work that you've been doing and it is just wonderful to see how far your influence has gone across the African continent and the important work that you're doing. I was absolutely fascinated to see that eight or one in eight of our global birds are threatened and that's a really really scary statistic given the sort of just over 10,000 species that are declared to science um, according to our current listing practices. And this really does highlight just how important monitoring and evaluating is when it comes to our species and our ecosystems in this ever-changing world that we find ourselves in. And the other thing I didn't know that you shared with us was that there are eight of the 36 biodiversity hotspots globally on the African continent. And I think that really justifies your work in how important it is to protect the natural heritage in Africa. And seeing the establishment of these new key biodiversity areas across the continent are hopefully going to be a really powerful step forward to safeguard these most critical sites. But I think one of the biggest challenges that we really face is mainstreaming our conservation agenda into political and social settings. And mm -hmm. I'm definitely going to raise this with you in a moment. But uh, yes. before we before we get to that, um, if anyone does have any questions for Bazing, please remember you can put them into the question and answer box. If you're tuning in through Facebook Live, just pop them into the comment feed and we will feed these across to Bazing. And a reminder to everyone as you exit, there is a two minute survey that we'd love you to fill in for us on SurveyMonkey. It just helps us keep these webinars relevant and also gives us a bit of feedback on what you thought of tonight's webinar. Next week, BirdLife South Africa's spatial planning and data manager Ernst Retif will be sharing some of the results from BirdLife South Africa's science and innovation programs, recent habitat suitability modeling exercises for over a hundred of the most threatened birds in South Africa. And so also share how these models are being used in the conservation sector and at multiple scales from government down to local stakeholders. So be sure to tune in for that one. We're really looking forward to that talk. But Bazing, on to you. I see we've got a question here from Thomas asking, he really enjoyed your talk. We know that South Africa has a section of sites called critical biodiversity areas. And he wants to know how these compare with KBAs. So Bazing, do you, do you, can you just elaborate on what a critical biodiversity biodiversity area is, and then elaborate on how they differ from key biodiversity areas, please. So uh, the, the, the challenge with, with, with South Africa is that South Africa already has uh, many of these partial biodiversity products. You have your IBAs, you have your CBAs, which are the critical biodiversity areas. And then now we have the KBAs, which is uh, coming to confuse many people. 
and at the beginning, a lot of people were not much interested in this. But uh, the CBA is more, it's a special biodiversity uh, planning unit at, in South Africa that looks at areas that are really critical for biodiversity. But uh, KBAs also look at holistically, just like those network of sites, including your birds, uh, your plants, and other biodiversity. And the work that has been done with the support of BirdLife South Africa has been able to, to try and uh, look at how this, uh, this uh, new network of KBAs overlap or compares with your CBAs, your IBAs, and ENS has been very, very great in, in the South African space to be able to identify how, how the IBAs compare with, with, the, with the KBAs in South Africa. There are quite some uh, 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 matches and mismatches in terms of, of those sites. And South Africa is really uh, at a challenging uh, point because uh, it's a mega diverse country. And we are trying to look at what special units to be able to, to cut those KBAs from and identify them without really excluding like your IBAs or those important products that are for uh, special products that have been mobilized in the country. So in, in South Africa already, we have most of those CBAs that are within your, your KBAs and some that are out of those uh, KBAs. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we sometimes fall foul of the acronym in the conservation world. As you said, we've got all these different IBAs, KBAs, CBAs, and uh, getting everyone to talk on the same page can often be a bit of a challenge. But hopefully now we've got the KBA standards together, those key biodiversity areas, and that will be the new global standard going forward that we can all sort of sing from the same hymn sheet. I wanted yeah, to ask, so, the, oh, sorry, go for it. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, think that, that's why we're really having this KBA standard to make sure everyone is consistent with, with the terminology we are using. Everyone understands globally when I say a site is a KBA, what has gone into the identification of those sites. Because if I call CBA, it might mean something different from someone in Kenya or in Cameroon or in Europe. So we just want to have a, a, a standard, a, a transparent and a standardized uh, format of identifying important sites for biodiversity. Absolutely, and I think it's it's so great that the IUCN and many other partners, BirdLife International and WWF and many others have been working together to come up with that global standard for site-based conservation. It's sorely needed, and at least now we, we're starting to make some good headway on that front. You mentioned in your talk that as a conservation community, we're often viewed as opposing development and very against kind of losing our natural heritage to um, economic development and practices that cause us to lose natural areas but we obviously know that Africa is one of the least developed continents in the world and there's a sore need for Africa to develop how do we go about balancing the need for the African economy to grow with safeguarding our sites and how do you see your work playing into that yeah uh, I think uh, thank you for that question Melissa I think uh, this is a very relevant question like you said and I also mentioned in my presentation we are often seen as trying to oppose uh, uh, development. And we really need this development for, for Africa to emerge and be in the same uh, uh, level like other European and American countries. But we don't really want to do this at the detriment of biodiversity. We know biodiversity underpins uh, most of our livelihood. And what we are trying to do, especially the work we are trying to do in Africa, is to be able to identify this important site that we can work together with the different sectors, the different development sectors, to make sure our biodiversity and development outcome are both achieved without impacting each other. Because uh, if we mainstream, like the mainstreaming component of the work we are doing is to be able to work with these uh, uh, development uh, uh, agencies and to work with the national government to be able to bring them on board and make sure they understand why we are identifying those sites, why biodiversity is important and how to develop away from this site and even in, in that, there are some instances where development will really happen at those sites of biodiversity, but there are also options to offset that biodiversity. You know, the company has to pay for a similar biodiversity element in that area and pay for the conservation of that area just to make sure the species really um, uh, thrive and then provide the, the kind of benefits that are providing to local people. Absolutely. And I think that really speaks to the heart of having natural assets and really giving our, our natural biodiversity and economic value because as we know from ecotourism and other practices that really see the value in having these natural spaces not just the 
the value of tourism, but the actual ecosystem services they're providing to us. So we've got to start recognizing that contribution to the economy as well and to our survival. So it's certainly a very, very important, important point. Thanks for Zing. I see we've got our, our colleague, Imba Pile from ESCOM tuned in. It's lovely to have you with us, Imba. And she's asking how the key biodiversity areas strategy um, ties into the initiative of the National Protected Area Expansion Strategy. Now, just for our viewers who are not up on some of our environmental policies and practices, the Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries has a National Protected Area Expansion Strategy, which governs a lot of the ways that our protected areas are expanded and a lot of our conservation estate is really identified for um, investment and, and sort of safeguarding. So how are the key biodiversity areas being incorporated into the strategy, Bazing, and have they actually written that into the protected area expansion strategy yet? Well, for, for South Africa, I, I would not be really, uh, I would not be the right person to answer, but I'll try just to give a, a, a broad overview of this. Because um, like, like I said in my presentation, most protected area, the strategy to expand protected area has been, uh, has been shaped by your large and your uh, charismatic mammals that go a long way, like they have a broad range. And they've often neglected like your small mammals, uh, your reptiles, your amphibians, and your plants. So identifying these key biodiversity areas, we have uh, even donors at this point who are very willing to only uh, uh, focus on protected a uh, area expansion in where you have key biodiversity areas. So it's really a mechanism to, to show or more support on where we should strategically place our protected areas. But in the South African context, I'm not very aware. I know there's a, there's a strategy that is being worked or maybe published by now, but I don't know how, how uh, uh, the KBA process is informing that because we are still at a, maybe a, at an early stage of identifying those sites and then publishing those sites. But maybe in future, perhaps in future, those KBAs, uh, potential KBAs that are not within protected area will be able to inform uh, where we should strategically expand our protected area networks in South Africa. Absolutely, thanks Bazing. And I know we've been providing a lot of information and our speaker next week, Ernst Ratif, has been integral in informing the bird data aspect of the new KBA layers. They haven't been finalized as yet. The South African National Biodiversity Institute, also known as SANBI, is working very, very hard under Andrew Skorono to make sure that we can get these layers as accurate as possible and as well informed as possible. So that includes getting data from things like dragonflies, butterflies, reptiles. It is a huge undertaking. And obviously we know how diverse our plant life is here in South Africa and being a well-established botanist, Bazing, I'm sure you can speak to just how lucky yeah. we are to the botanical diversity here in South Africa. But those exactly. KBA layers are definitely gonna go out for comment, hopefully in the next couple of uh, years, maybe even sooner. And that'll definitely be something which we'll talk about on the, the webinar series at some point. But Ernst next week will be sharing some of the information that he's been giving to the KBA layers. And it's certainly interesting to see this developing here in South Africa. We're one of the first countries to really embrace the KBA standard. I know Australia has done it as well. So it's good to see that we're sort of at the forefront of really driving the KBA process. And your direct boss, Daniel Manowick, has been extremely influential in pushing KBAs at a global scale. So we're very lucky to have him in our fold exactly. and directly with us. Exactly. And we are, we are South Africa is sharing those lessons, uh, not only with African countries, we are sharing those, sharing those lessons with the KBA Technical Working Group, because um, you can imagine identifying those sites for a mega diverse country it will definitely have, it's the first time uh, many countries are testing those, uh, um, the thresholds. It will definitely have a major implication for the revision of those uh, uh, the guidelines. So it's, South Africa is really at a unique uh, uh, point in testing this, especially for us, we are a mega diverse country. Absolutely, and I see Greta's got a question here around the legal entrenchment of KBAs. And we obviously are not at that point yet as South Africans, but certainly as we start moving forward, I suspect there will be gazetted notices to give KBAs a bit more legislative weight as we move mm. forward, because South Africa has definitely embraced the standard as the new site-based standard going forward. Mm. I see we've got a question here from Robert smith Bazang, and he's now moving us to local level, not so much the, the higher level policy government um, mm. issues that we've been talking about, but 
how do we encourage local communities to buy into conservation? And in particular, something like a KBA, how do you go about in your day-to-day -day work encouraging local level individuals to really embrace this concept and take biodiversity evaluation and monitoring forward? Yeah, that's that's a very great uh, question. Uh, I think for, for a long time, uh, conservation has been anti-local people. So it's not really involved local people Although these people have lived with biodiversity for a very long time, now we come up with conservation strategies and actions that really exclude them. And one thing the IUCN is, is, is doing now, or uh, even BirdLife that is uh, an IUCN member, uh, we're trying to include local people into conservation and especially for, for key biodiversity areas. So we want to develop uh, conservation actions around those areas that will include local people like I, I showed you some examples from those species that were brought back from the brink of extinction, you see the positive impact of local communities in saving these species. So trying to take them away from, from these species where they have lived with for, for many, many years will, will really uh, incentivize all the actions that you're creating to ensure the species survive. So I think one strategy is going to be a lot of awareness, uh, creating awareness about these species, um, showing them how to uh, use the species sustainably. Uh, I know that is a very uh, controversial topic and a hot one that will also be highlighted at the World Conservation Congress and how to include local people into conservation and what sustainable use means for them. So really including them in, into conservation action and uh, uh, making sure they are part of those actions will be a great initiative. And for KBAs, we have already started thinking about this, um, some of those actions. For example, trees that are of economic benefits to these, uh, these communities, we try to, to uh, I'm talking more from, from a plant point of view because I'm a botanist. Of course, uh, uh, I know um, uh, Andrew has a lot of uh, ideas about this uh, work with local communities and community guides. But for plants, what we are trying to do is to really create conservation actions, including local people, where we uh, uh, develop conservation actions around economically important tree species that are planted uh, and these uh, local communities can harvest those seeds or whatever parts that are, are being harvested from the species and they can sell to, to gain some income. So we're really including them into the conservation actions and making sure they are aware that if these species go extinct, then they won't really have this uh, uh, economic incentive that they're getting from the species. Absolutely. I think that's such an important point. I think we're really moving into more of an integrative conservation landscape these days where you really do need to involve people in the work that we're doing. We can't just put a fence around it anymore. We've got to involve the communities, get them to buy into what we're trying to do. And as you say, manage our natural assets sustainably as the sort of custodians of those natural assets on the ground. So it's wonderful to see that you are doing that. And I think it really speaks to our citizen scientists out there who go out day in and day out and collect spatial data for us in random parts of the world that are helping us to inform where our biodiversity still is and what we need to be investing in. So if you are listening in and you are a contributor to any of the citizen science initiatives, here is a big shout out to all of you and a big thank you for doing what you do because it really does make our lives a lot easier having that data available. Great. Great, Bazing, I think um, we have run a little bit over time, so I think I'm gonna call it there, but before I let you go, being the, the very keen birder that you are developing into, and uh, I'm very, very proud to see that you are getting more and more into your birds. What is your favorite bird you've seen so far on your birding journey? Well, I've, I've really enjoyed, I mean, going out with you, I've had a lot to see uh, a secretary bird for my first time so it was really it was a big joy for me to see that bird i've always wanted to see and yeah going to vacas room was really the first time to see that bird brilliant really i'm so glad you chose that one <laughs> <laughs> well done <laughs> awesome everybody thank you so much for tuning in tonight reminder next week ernst Ratif joins us Zeng, thank you so much that was absolutely fascinating and i think the work you're doing is so vital and so important in keeping Africa's biodiversity at the top of everyone's agendas. So please keep doing what you do. And uh, a big thank you for coming on tonight and sharing what you do with all of us. I don't know if you've got any real, closing statements you'd like to share with yeah, us it, before we switch it off. It was a real pleasure. It was a real pleasure to be here to share um, uh, our experience and the really 
important lessons that uh, BirdLife South Africa and experiences that BirdLife South Africa is uh, sharing to, to help support other African countries to be at the same level, or if not beyond South Africa, to mobilize or to assess their biodiversity and report or support all these uh, national development uh, priorities that are happening in country. And for those that I couldn't answer your question because of time, maybe I can just have a list of those questions and I'll drop you like a personal <laughs> email or what. I don't know. Well, yeah. definitely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa, for hosting. Yeah, really great and exciting to be here. Awesome. Thank you for saying, and thanks for all the effort you put into that talk. All right, everybody, it is time to sign off. Enjoy your evening. We will see you same time, same place next week, Tuesday. Keep safe and happy birding. Keep those eyes on the skies and keep enjoying those birds. I'll see you next week. Good night, everyone.